Now, everybody knows that Bach is celebrated as one of the greatest composers and improvisers in music history. But what I want to know is, what do we know of Bach, the teacher? Did he have many students? And how long did he teach in his career? Bach taught almost for his entire professional career, more or less four decades, or even perhaps a little bit longer. He had many, many recorded students, up to 90, I think, that we wow. know of probably more that we don't know of. And his teaching, well, <laughs> it's hard to pin down an exact answer. Um, so the, the work of my dissertation was to try to make as coherent an answer to that question as possible by piecing together all of the information that's available to us directly through Bach and also through secondary sources that are of, at a varying degree of remove from Bach. So one of the things that comes directly from Bach is a statement that he made in a testimonial for a student. So imagine you're, you, you had just studied with Bach and now you go off into the world and you want to audition to um, be an organist somewhere. Well, you needed some proof that you studied with Bach, so he would write you a testimonial. And he did just that. And he wrote that um, this particular pupil uh, named Wild or uh, Spell W-I-L-D, like wild. Anyway, this particular student um, studied with Bach, and he said that Witt learned the fundamental rules of composition, which are derived from thorough bass and the keyboard. The fundamental rules of composition, which are derived from thorough bass and the keyboard. So I thought that was so interesting, e even though this... This particular document has been known for many years. Nobody has really called attention to that phrase and how important it is for our understanding of Bach's um, teaching and potentially for his own um, conception of music as well. You talk about, so that's one of the four foundational documents that yes. you used for your research. So that one was his testimonial because okay. one of those foundational documents is a 1775 letter from Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, his son, to Forkel, Bach's biographer. And it says that Bach, and they were not interested in dry species exercises like Fuchs. Yeah, yeah. So there I think uh, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach is trying to distance his father from Fuchs. Um, he, he doesn't, in that particular statement, I think he doesn't mention Fuchs, but he does uh, later on. And I think that just means that Bach um, took a practical, practical approach. He, um, well, that, that, that we, can, we can see from Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach's description of his father's teaching, but we can also see it, for instance, in the famous obituary that he says uh, that the authors of the obituary say that Bach was a master of practical music. There's always this emphasis on practical music. So what that means is that he wasn't interested in um, mathematical speculation about uh, tuning and so forth. Um, so just because Bach didn't use Fuchs's species approach doesn't mean that he uh, didn't take it or he didn't value counterpoint. Okay, so people are really interested in how Bach taught. Let's lay out the path then. So how would have Bach taught a student from the beginning? Well, if we believe Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, then we would uh, believe that his father, Johann Sebastian, began with thorough bass. And he began with four-voice thorough bass, and he required his students to write it out. And that means not just thorough bass as um, improvised uh, accompaniment, but actually being written out. And there's a, there's a document that we have that confirms that from a, a pupil of Bach. So written out four voice thorough bass was apparently the first step. From that, he went to chorales. Wait chorale one second, uh, Derek, one quick question. So that's one voice in the bass and three voices yeah. in the right hand. Absolutely. And do, you have, the, do they have very strict yeah. counterpoint as well? You have to make sure the voice leading is perfect? Absolutely. There's a document from one of Bach's pupils that um, has corrections in Bach's hand. And from his corrections, we can see that Bach was very, very 
detail-oriented about the realization of those three upper voices in the right hand. So um, it, you it can was, get technical. Don't worry. Just this is this is a smart was, audience. <laughs> well, he he, uh, he of course he in a couple spots he corrected uh, some parallel fifths in the middle voices, but he he was concerned with having a flowing upper voice. He was concerned with um, doubling. He was concerned with um, uh, the representation of, well, I guess we just say the doubling. Um, if for people who really want to get technical, I talk about this in the uh, part three of chapter one in my dissertation, where I go through this document with a really fine tooth comb and talk about all the corrections that Bach made. So you're saying he's very strict. So he won't even allow parallels in the inner voices. No. He wouldn't have. Now, that's a that's sort of a, a question that, well, we know from a lot of Italian sources that um, thorough bass, if it's understood purely as accompaniment, that maybe you don't have to take it so seriously and you don't have to be so strict about like having parallels between two middle voices. So, um, But from Bach's corrections and also from the treatise of Bach's son, Carl Philip Emanuel, we, uh, I believe that Bach would have requ required the utmost strictness of all voices, not uh, not allowing parallels in the middle voices or anything like that. But there is there is one caveat to that, and um, that has to do with like imagine that we have like a a, a chordal um, chordal texture like this. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear this, but. You know, the bass just goes C, D, E, but that bass line could also be ornamented, like. And after I add those, those ornamenting notes between the sort of structural notes, I actually ended up making parallels with the upper voices. And that's sort of an open question about whether those things could be, could be uh, allowed. Heinichen seems to have allowed them in his treatise and I think they were probably allowed, as long as the structural notes didn't have parallels. But that's still up for debate. Did he stay with four voices, or did he go? Did he pare it down to three voices, or even two voices? Actually, I think rather than getting going to less voices, he went to more voices. This is something that is really, really great, and I, I absolutely love this topic. It's called full voiced realization. Um, there's a there is an anecdote in Kittel's treatise where he talks about uh, his, well, actually it was 50 years prior um, that Kittel uh, was a choir boy in Leipzig. I actually, I'm not sure if he was a choir boy. No, he, he, he must have been. He must have been um, because he talks about um, that whoever accompanied one of Bach's church pieces, like a cantata, had to be absolutely, absolutely sure that they had prepared a good realization of that baseline. But Kittel says, and this is kind of funny, he says that no matter how well the pupil prepared that thorough bass realization, he always had to expect that um, Bach's hands would reach over his shoulder and, and create, quote, masses of harmonies. So there we have um, thorough bass as uh, not as a compositional exercise where it would be written out in four strict voices, but rather in uh, the full voiced style. And what that means is that you grab all the notes that you can in the left hand and you grab all the notes that you can in the right hand. And all you care about is that you avoid parallels in the outer voices. But you can have parallel fifths and octaves involving the middle voices because all you care about is creating more sound. And that's, that's the primary means by which you can control the dynamics on a harpsichord or an organ by playing with more or with fewer voices. So there aren't that many thorough bass sources from Bach or even from Bach's circle that contain thorough bass realization in fewer than four voices. Now, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach discusses uh, uh, in, in part two of his treatise um, lots of instances where he says, well, if you don't want to do it four voices, you can do it three voices this way, and here's the note that you would omit. But uh, I think it's really helpful to, to learn how to play in, in the full voice style because it's fun, and you don't have to be so strict, and you, you just make a great sound on the instrument. 
Okay, the one thing that I like to kind of compare this to the Italian methods of Partimento. Can I ask, when it comes to melodies, did they, did he have a way of teaching melodic writing? Like the Italians have solfeggio. Did that ever, did you notice any of that in, in, the, in the pedagogy? There's very little direct instruction about that. So um, in the 18th century, there was, well, there, there raged a lot of debates, but one of them was regarding what's primary, melody or harmony. And the guy who fell on the melody side of that was um, Matheson, uh, Johann Matheson. And he has a giant book called the uh, Kapellmeister, something something about the Kapellmeister. And uh, that's actually available in an English translation. That is like a, it's like as big as the Bible. It's, a, wow. it's an in, enormous book. And like, like I said, luckily that's available in English for people who are interested and want to check it out. And he, he does discuss the art of melody. But in terms of um, things that come directly from Bach, there's not a lot, I have to admit. Um, there's actually, I can't think of any single source that uh, discusses melody on its own. There's things about counterpoint and thorough bass and, and, and well, counterpoint and thorough bass would be the, the two big things, but melody itself, not so much. One thing about the Italian method is eventually there are no more figures. Is that true? Is that, is that different in the German tradition? Well, I, let's put it this way. If you were a practicing musician, you had to be able to deal with unfigured basses because um, every organist, every uh, harpsichordist had to be able to accompany. And it was, well, imagine, you know, it was, you got the piece hot off the press and the composer who was perhaps you, but it, it could have been somebody else who didn't have time to write in the figures. So you had to learn, you had to know how to deal with that. So, um, Heineken spends an entire chapter discussing how to realize unfigured bases. And there's an interesting line from Carl Philip, Emanuel Bach. He says, um, I've, I've experimented with such um, rules myself, but it, it hasn't come to anything. And in the end, I think that um, the art of accompanying from unfigured bases, that there's not so much that you can say about it. Well, Heineken would beg to differ, I think. And of course, the Italians would also beg to differ. Um, so I, I think it's not that there was a specific step like there is in some of the Italian collections where the student goes from figured basis to unfigured basis. I think it was just assumed that everybody could do that or everybody would eventually encounter that in their um, professional life. Is Heineken and Neat and Bach's conception of thorough bass equal? Do they all have the same, like, to them, thorough bass is the same rules, everything is the same? Or do they all have slightly different idiosyncratic rules? Well, in terms of documents that come directly from Bach that address thorough bass, all we have is a brief list of rules at the end of the notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach. And that remains quite basic. It just, it basically addresses 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 the um, the issue of abbreviations. It says, you know, when you see a six as an abbreviated figure, here are the notes that you can add. So that doesn't get into much detail. If you are convinced by my argument in the dissertation that we can look to Heineken to understand Bach's conception of thorough base, then you could say that um, there are many similarities between neat and Heineken. Neat, however, wasn't a professional musician. Um, and his instruction is really for the absolute beginners. And Heineken, on the other hand, starts uh, at a very basic level, but then he, his aim at least, is to give everything that somebody would need to know about composition in order to reach the, the pinnacle of the profession. In his, so, so he goes into a lot more detailed than Neat does. Now, in terms of their conception, though, both of them do rely on the idea of, a, of an underlying skeleton. And Neat has a famous chapter where he shows how you can improvise all the different um, movements of a suite based on the same thorough bass skeleton. And 
that is uh, something that is absolutely central to Heineken's teaching, that you have um, what, what he calls the fundamental notes, and those adhere to the traditional rules of counterpoint. And then on top of that layer, you add like the icing on the cake, and that's all of the ornaments. That's all the figuration. But the reason that Thoroughbase can, can convey the principles of counterpoint is that when you strip away all of that figuration, you are left with this skeleton that adheres to the same rules of counterpoint that uh, were in effect in the Renaissance. And that's also another argument that I make, that, that Thoroughbase was seen as capable of synthesizing the traditional rules of counterpoint. And by traditional rules of counterpoint, I mean the traditional handling of dissonance in two categories, transitus and syncopatio. Those are the two main categories of dissonance in not only in the Renaissance, but also, also in the Baroque. And so what is transitus? It comes from the word transit to go through. It, it describes um, what we would call passing in neighbor tones today. And syncopatio describes uh, how to handle a syncopation, which means a, um, a suspension. So in, the, in that regard, there are a lot of similarities between Heineken and Neat, but Heineken goes into much more detail. Okay, so Heineken spent a couple of years in Italy, and it seems like he powered up and came back. Did he? Did I'm curious about Bach and Heineken's Italian connection. Did did that? Did his treatise? Because he he wrote a first treatise earlier, like 1711, right? Yeah. And then he yeah. he had a more updated one, which Bach, I'm sure. Yeah. Did he sell that in his house or something? Yeah, Bach. Uh, for whatever reason, Bach was the. Um, representative, or he acted as representative of the publisher, meaning that um, if you wanted to get Heineken's treatise, you could go to Bach's house in Leipzig and you could buy it from him. So there were copies of, of Heineken's treatise in in Bach's house. So he, I, I mean, I assume he must have at least opened <laughs> up a little. Right, right. Um, yes. But uh, actually, an, another thing that's interesting is that uh, if you compare Heineken and CPE box treatises, they are so similar. There, and I go into that in in chapter one of my dissertation. There are so many similarities. So that might speak for Bach, uh, Johann Sebastian acting as sort of like a bridge between the two, or maybe CPE read the tr Heineken treatise himself. Who knows? Now let's move to. I interrupted you because you were going to go to Corral. And we were talking about Bach's yes. pedagogical path. Let's talk about chorale. So let's say a student is pretty well trained in thorough bass. What happens now? Well, according to Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, um, his father would then move on to the topic of chorales. And the first thing that he would do is he would provide the outer voices, presumably with thorough bass figures, because that's the way they appear in all the chorale books. And all that the pupil had to do was add the two middle voices. And after the pupil had had got enough experience essentially realizing the given thorough bass with the chorale and the soprano. That's all that it really is, is thorough bass realization with a given soprano. Then he moved on to this critical step, and he says that then they learn to compose their own basses. Now, it's interesting that, uh, that Carl Philip uses the plural basses, and it, it's a little bit ambiguous what he means. Um, but what's so interesting about Susan McCormick's work is that she has revealed that there is an entire tradition of multiple bass chorales um, in Germany in Bach's day with many, many connections to Bach himself. And what that means is that um, there are, well, the sources are, the sources show us that there's a chorale in the melody, and then there's anywhere between two and like maybe a hundred. The, actually, the, the, the one source I know of that has the most basses would be a hundred. Really? So you um, mean there's one melody and just tons of basses? Tons of different with basses. Figures. Under, with figures, yes. So, so the idea was that um, it, this, this goes beyond mere thorough bass accompaniment. This is trying to extract as much 
potential, as much contrapuntal potential from this given melody as one possibly can. And it's really interesting to see what people like Kittle do with his basses, where they become progressively more complicated and ornate and chromatic. It's really fascinating. So like, if you want to see a source of this, uh, you can go on my uh, Facebook group, which is available to the public. You don't have to have a Facebook account. Um, and I have a post. I, I don't have the date um, on hand immediately, but I, I posted a source from Kittel where you can take a look at some of these multiple bases. So getting back to Bach's pedagogy, it's not exactly clear whether um, Carl Philip meant that his father used multiple base pedagogy or whether he just uh, had his pupils write a single base under multiple chorale melodies. So, but my argument is that Bach absolutely must have been aware of the tradition of multiple base chorale harmonization. And it seems to me that he probably would have used it at some point, given the importance that many people in his, um, in his circle attribute to this, like Kittel, Kernberger, Marpurg, and lots of other people too that don't have as direct a connection with Bach. So, okay, that, that's the multiple base uh, corral area. And then the next thing uh, Carl Phillips says is that his, his father went to the topic of fugue. Okay, wait, okay, great. Now let's go on to fugue now. I, I'm so excited to find out how we go from corral to fugue because uh, where, where does the, uh, the study of imitation, when does that happen? Well, I, I have to say that I, <laughs> I don't have a, a concrete answer. I can't say Bach did it like this. But I did, in chapter three of my dissertation, describe a lot of the ways in which the techniques of fugue, which is to say imitation and invertible counterpoint, in w the ways in which these techniques are uh, present already in chorale, chorale harmonization. So that's one um, way of transitioning from the topic of chorale to fugue. The, the other one, which is really quite obvious and I think is not emphasized enough today, is um, fugal improvisation and composition on chorale melodies. This was part and parcel of, the, uh, of an organist's daily life, that you had to be able to improvise um, a preludes, intonations, and, and the such in the church service using the chorale melodies. So, for instance, there's a, um, there's a source that I recently translated. It's available. Uh, it's called, um, what's it called? The, the, review, the article where you can find it is called uh, Composition, Compositional Pedagogy Near J.S. Bach, Editions and Translations of Four Sources. And that's it freely available online. And one of those four sources is a treatise by Pachelbel's pupil, Eckelt. And um, he describes how to compose a fugue on a chorale melody. So presumably Bach's pupils would have done that as well. But I also want to emphasize that um, given Bach's statement that the, the fundamental principles of composition are derived from third base at the keyboard, it's particularly important to uh, emphasize the genre of thorough bass fugue. Now, I just on a personal note, I really wish somebody would have told me about this genre when I was an, an undergrad and in high school and stuff, because you know, fugue is always viewed as this um, terrifying thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Terrifyingly complicated and uh, unattainable, and and so forth. And a thorough bass fugue is so wonderful because it frames fugue in terms of something that you already understand in terms of thorough bass. So there are two thorough bass fugues that we believe Bach used in his lessons. Now, the thing about these fugues is that they're really complicated. <laughs> so it, it's, it, it's sort of going against my, uh, my argument here that the thorough bass fugue makes fugue, uh, the genre of fugue more accessible. But, but knowing I mean, Bach, if you're very good at thorough bass and you're well-trained, you should be more or less a little bit more prepared for this, right? 
Yes, abs- absolutely. And and I I give my own realizations of these fugues in in chapter three. You can check them out, and there's even uh, facsimiles of the original um, that you can that you can look at. So that that would be two ways of transitioning from uh, transitioning to fugue. The first is to use a chorale melody as your fugal subject, which is generally a little bit more. It, it's gonna imply that the fugue is gonna be a little bit easier because chorale melodies are just simple melodies, you know, without a lot of ornamentation. Um, and the other side is that you can understand fugue in terms of thorough bass. So there are important uh, sources containing thorough bass fugues from Bach's day, and I talk about all of the ones that we know of in chapter three of my dissertation. 